Um, hope you're doing well. Um, and welcome to our second talk of the term. Um, and before I introduce our speaker, I just have a couple of words from our sponsors. Um, so our first sponsor is BitBio, founded by Dr. Mark Cotter and Florence Schuster. BitBio is an award-winning human synthetic biology enterprise. Their mission is to code cells for health. To do so, they apply the principles of computation to biology. Their current focus is to develop a scalable technology platform capable of producing consistent batches of every human cell. We'd also like to thank another sponsor, CRISPR Biotech Engineering, an early stage genome editing company using CRISPR-Cas9 to develop immunogenomics-based therapies as well as providing educational resources. Today, we're honored to have Professor John M. Archibald as our speaker. He's the Distinguished University Research Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Dalhousie University in Halifax, and also the director of their Center for Comparative Genomics and Evolutionary Bioinformatics. Um, and his current research utilizes molecular, biological, and computational methods to study the evolutionary history of and relationships between eukaryotic microbes. Um, so I'll just hand over to John. Thank you for coming. Okay, uh, everything okay? You can see my screen and cursor and you can hear me okay? Um, we can't see your screen yet. Uh, you, can you see my shared screen? My opening slide, no? Not quite, no. Um, uh, okay, let's just uh, try that again and um, Right. Apologies for that. Okay, that should be it. Yeah, we can see it now. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. And you can see a cursor here too when I move it around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So wonderful uh, to be with you. Um, I mentioned briefly, I was uh, on sabbatical at Cambridge. Um, in 2012, so uh, which feels like a lifetime ago now, but it's great to be back with you, so to speak, and uh, to have a chance to, to chat with you about some of uh, my research interests and the things that are going on in my lab. Um, I'm guessing that most, if not all of you on the line are undergraduates, so I'm going to try and uh, keep this at an introductory level, at least in, in certain respects and there'll be an opportunity hopefully for questions and we can dive a little bit deeper um, at, the, at the end of the talk. Uh, I won't be able to see if you put your hands up, at least with my current setup of, of screen sharing. So if, if people do wanna interrupt uh, as we go along, you're, you're welcome to do so. So um, you could just, you're somehow gonna to have to get my, my attention. So mergers and acquisitions, what does that mean? Well. I've been uh, studying the, the evolution of um, eukaryotic organelles for a long time. And when I was in your shoes as an undergraduate, I recall learning about the so-called endosymbiotic origin of mitochondria on the left and chloroplasts or plastids on the right. And uh, I was smitten by the idea that these organelles, these membrane bound organelles in, in eukaryotes had their own genomes and that those genomes could tell us important things about evolutionary history. So this idea that genomes are uh, trackers in a certain sense of, of molecular evolution was, was just um, amazing to me. And uh, as I went on, I did graduate school uh, in, in similar, uh, studying similar sorts of things and eventually wanted to make a career out of it. So you'll see these themes running through this, through this talk. Um, eukaryotic or, or nuclear, uh, nucleus containing cells, um, uh, their nuclear genome is a mosaic of genes from different uh, sources. So we've already talked about mitochondria and chloroplasts. You know that those are textbook organelles that are derived from once free living bacterial predecessors and over evolutionary time during, during their integration, those bacteria donated uh, genetic material to the nuclear genome. 
and have become fully integrated membrane bound organelles that we uh, that we all learn about in introductory biology courses. But one of the things that's become clear as we uh, learn more about the molecular biology and genomics of, of eukaryotes, in particular microbial eukaryotes, is that uh, the picture is rather more complicated than simply mitochondria and chloroplasts donating genetic material through this process of endosymbiotic gene transfer or EGT. Uh, there is also a phenomenon called HGT, that stands for horizontal or sometimes lateral gene transfer. And that is uh, the trans transfer genetic material. It can be from prokaryotes or eukaryotes or uh, even viruses uh, in, in some sort of context that is independent of EGT. And so I'm using this slide to sort of set the stage for what will become a very, very uh, complex picture and puzzle that molecular evolutionists like myself have been trying to solve for uh, going on 20 years or so now. So my talk today is going to be broken up into two parts. The first one is going to be a, an overview of what I refer to as the puzzle of plastid evolution. So plastids or chloroplasts, again, are these um, cyanobacterium-derived uh, organelles in photosynthetic eukaryotes. Uh, and, and we're going to segue from addressing these deep uncertainties or puzzles in that in that field to a discussion of more recent uh, evolutionary processes impacting um, the uh, mosaic nature of nuclear genomes. So uh, if this whole talk as a whole will really be a, a, a contrast in, in trying to infer ancient events uh, by studying extant genomes and uh, and also fine scale comparative genomics between very closely related organisms. So that's the structure of the talk. So I'm not sure how much of this background biology uh, most of you are familiar with, but this is a cartoon version of the origin of photosynthesis in eukaryotes. And this is a process referred to as primary endosymbiosis. So if we start over on the left here, we have an endosymbiotic merger between a eukaryotic host and a prokaryotic endosymbiont. Uh, the best dates on that uh, primordial event, probably a billion uh, plus years ago, give or take. Uh, so very ancient. And biologists are in general agreement that there are three main lines of eukaryotes that have uh, evolved since that ancient event. Uh, the red algae, the green algae and, and the green line uh, is, of course, the one that eventually gave rise to uh, land plants. So uh, the, the multicellular forms that um, dominate the, the uh, terrestrial biosphere. And there's actually a third line, the glaucophytes, which I won't talk about today, but um, they are relatively rare, but interesting lineage. So these three main uh, lines all have plastids derived from this primordial endosymbiotic event. Now let's unpack that a little bit uh, at the level of genomes and cells. So this is a cartoon version of a sort of a generic plastid containing eukaryotic cell. Okay, I've told you already that uh, these plastids evolved from, from once free living bacteria. And this was a merger between a eukaryotic host and, a, and some sort of a cyanobacterium. Biologists are, are still uncertain as to the exact nature of that cyanobacterium, but we can infer that it had probably between 1,500 and perhaps 7,000, maybe even 10,000 genes. We don't know. If we fast forward uh, a billion years or so, what we find is an organism uh, whose cells look like the one on the right again. And the, the genome of uh, uh, primary plastid or chloroplast has at most, if you look at uh, modern day lineages, has about 70 to 200 genes, okay, at most. 
And yet, if uh, you study biochemically the protein composition of that plastid as it uh, functions in the cell, you will find that there are anywhere between 1,500 and up to 5,000 proteins in that organelle. And so something uh, doesn't quite add up there, okay? Less than 200 genes, more than 1,000 proteins. The solution to this discrepancy is again, this phenomenon of endosymbiotic gene transfer. So during the integration and even after the integration of the cyanobacterial progenitor of this organelle, DNA has moved from this compartment here in green to the nuclear genome. And the gene products of those transferred uh, genes, these proteins in green here are translated on cytosolic ribosomes, and those proteins are re-imported back into the into the plastid. Now, this phenomenon I'm not going to talk about in detail today, but we do know from various lines of, of evidence that the cyanobacterial-derived genes um, also encode proteins that function elsewhere in a photosynthetic eukaryote independent of the chloroplast. Okay, so that's a bit of a, a high-level uh, overview of the molecular biology that has transpired over, over time in the earliest photosynthetic eukaryotes. Now, it, uh, if only it were that simple, um, there is a phenomenon called secondary endosymbiosis, and that is a process whereby uh, a eukaryotic organism engulfs another eukaryotic organism, okay? So a non-photosynthetic host eukaryote uh, engulfs a photosynthetic endosymbiont and the two eukaryotic organisms um, evolve to become a single entity. And if you've not heard about that before, um, it's, it's fascinating. There's a whole host of different algal forms in nature that have acquired photosynthesis secondarily. And in fact, there's even something called tertiary endosymbiosis, and you can get a sense for what that uh, means. So, so the picture you should, or uh, it's useful to have in your mind, is this, this idea of uh, Russian nesting dolls. So in this case, the, the um, analogy is that the dolls are like cells, and, and much of algal biodiversity is the product of these repeated uh, waves of endosymbiosis where one cell is inside another cell uh, and that pair are uh, indeed inside uh, yet another uh, cell and they become integrated genetically, biochemically, and cell biologically over, over evolutionary time. And in, in terms of the genes, we, or I at least refer to these, these, nest, these events as nested waves of uh, EGT. So in the primary endosymbiosis, we have genetic material moving from the cyanobacterium into the primary nucleus. But then once you have a secondary endosymbiosis, um, that nested set of cells ends up inside yet a third cell and we have a second round of endosymbiotic gene transfer. So, so the nuclear genomes of these uh, host organisms, the secondary hosts, are really an amalgamation of genes coming from lots and lots of different places. And if we bundle on top of that, uh, this phenomenon of horizontal gene transfer, then you can see how it gets very, very complicated indeed. And I won't uh, talk about it in, in detail, but each of these steps, of course, requires the evolution of a protein trafficking machinery that is capable of transferring the protein products of the, the transfer genes back to um, the endosymbiotically derived compartment. So there's lots of fascinating and complex cell biology and biochemistry going on as well. Now, as I said, some of you won't uh, Maybe you're perhaps not familiar with the uh, this phenomenon, but just to underscore how important it is biologically on planet Earth, most of the eukaryotic algal diversity, in fact, is known to have plastids uh, that are of secondary origin, not prim primary origin. We think of trees and plants as being the most abundant 
photosynthetic eukaryotes because they're, uh, they're the macroscopic things that we see every day. But uh, in the world's oceans, it's actually the exact opposite. Most of the phytoplankton are secondarily uh, photosynthetic. And that includes organisms like dinoflagellates, uh, what are called heterocons, so uh, diatoms like are shown here, and um, their macroscopic relatives, giant kelps. Uh, haptophyte algae are an incredibly important uh, lineage of, of algae, and they form these massive um, algal blooms that you can see actually from outer space. So I'm showing you here a, an algal bloom off the coast of Nova Scotia, and in case you haven't you don't know where Halifax is, where I am now. This is uh, this arrowhead is pointing to Halifax, Nova Scotia here. So secondary endosymbiosis is massively important and has a huge, has had and continues to have a huge impact on the, on earth biogeochemistry. Now this is a, a busy slide. We're gonna look at it a, a couple of times today. What it is in essence is it is a, current synthesis of eukaryotic biodiversity. You and I are animals, of course, we're down at the bottom here. Um, and the more colorful bits of this tree are meant to illustrate the phototrophic lineages. And photosynthesis uh, in the grand scheme of things is patchy. And what I mean by that is uh, all of the eukaryotic phototrophs do not form a monophyletic lineage. The primary plastid bearing lines that I mentioned a moment ago, um, the red, the green, and the glaucophyte algae are over here in the left. They do form a monophyletic entity, but all of these other little colored bits and bobs around the tree are uh, photosynthetic groups that are nested within heterotrophic or uh, plastid lacking uh, lineages. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say patchy. And so that has, uh, is, is a source of um, great interest and, and also confusion on the part of people trying to infer the, the evolutionary history of photosynthesis in eukaryotes. I'm going to start off by telling you a story about two different eukaryotic lineages. Uh, one is the cryptophyte algae uh, up in the top left here, and the other one is the chloracnophytes on the right. And you'll see they're color-coded red and green, and that is because they have uh, photosynthetic organelles, in the case of the cryptophytes, of red algal endosymbiotic ancestry, and the chloracnophytes have green algal-derived uh, plastids, okay, independent origins of those two organelles. Uh, th this is a, a, a micrograph of what an actual cryptophyte cell looks like. And on the right hand side is a uh, cartoon rendition of a cryptophyte cell. Um, one of the reasons why they're so interesting, this particular lineage and why I got interested in them uh, when I started my lab in 2003 uh, is because they possess two distinct nuclei. So they have a, a main host nucleus, which is shown here, but they also have a residual nucleus called a nucleomorph. And that nucleomorph is the smoking gun, so to speak, of this process of secondary endosymbiosis, okay? Where you have one eukaryote coming inside another eukaryote, okay? So these cryptophyte cells are among the most complex cells known to science in terms of their genetics and cell biology. Very, very complex membrane uh, internal structures and four distinct genome containing compartments. Now the chloracnophytes are kind of the mirror image, uh, so to speak. Uh, they are green as you can see from these um, light micrographs. The name actually means green spider, chlor, chlor for chlorophyll and then arachneo as in spider. Uh, and they have green algal derived uh, chloroplasts and they also have nucleomorphs. So this is a, another lineage of nucleomorph bearing algae and they acquired it independent of the um, cryptophytes. 
this is just a, a again a, a close up of, of what a nucleomorph bearing alga looks like. And before I started publishing independently in my own group, it was known that nucleomorphs were these residual organelles that had very, very shrunken genomes, less than 1 million base pairs in size and uh, 300 to 500 genes at most. And so one of the things that people in my field knew is that if we were to try and uh, make a, a comprehensive picture and understanding of the biology of nucleomorph bearing algae, we would need to sequence the much larger nuclear genome of the, of the host organisms. And we did that uh, in the, um, well, I guess it was around the early to mid 2000s. This is just a, uh, to commemorate some of the people who really did a lot of work in this large collaboration. It involved uh, more than 70 people in 10 labs around the world. It took us about five years to sequence these two nuclear genomes. Um, this is in cartoon form what we uh, were able to determine. Uh, there's some numbers here on the bottom. Uh, they are between, well, 20 and 25,000 genes, roughly speaking, and less than 100 megabase pairs in, in size. So relatively small, sequenceable uh, genomes. Um, of interest, uh, there were lots of different analyses that we um, tried to do and, and did. I'm not sure whether you can hear that. Can you hear that siren? Yes, just give me one second, okay? I apologize for that. I just had to close the window. Um, this is a summary of uh, some of the types of questions that we addressed. We, we were interested in, in part in looking at this so-called footprint of genes that have moved the, the genes that have migrated over time from these uh, endosymbiotically derived nucleomorphs to the host nucleus and to try and reconstruct a better picture of the extent of that process in both cases and also the extent to which that process is still taking place today. And so I'm going to tell you just a couple of uh, little vignettes of, the, of this story. Now, the, uh, the bulk of this work was done by a, a very talented and hardworking PhD student of mine, Bruce Curtis. Um, we knew from our large scale analyses that there were lots of algal derived genes in the, uh, those nuclei. If we go back here, 500 clearly identifiable algal genes in the nuclear genome. In the case of the cryptophyte giardia, 350 or so in the case of the chloracneophyte Bigelow-Yella. But we also wanted to find out whether there was evidence for fine scale transfer as in happening more or less in real time. Um, and what Bruce did was to carry out a comprehensive DNA-based analysis to look for different types of endosymbiotic transfers. And what uh, you can see here um, is essentially the results. Now, uh, the people in this field have particular uh, nomenclature that defines these different types of transfers. So new mites, as it's pronounced, um, these, is, these are fragments of mitochondrial DNA that have been transferred. New peats are uh, plastid or chloroplast derived pieces of DNA. And we had to come up with a new name because no one had done an analysis like this before. We, we called them new nums. That was the best we could, could come up with. Um, these are new putative nucleomorph derived pieces of DNA. And what you're seeing here is a summary in both cases, uh, both of these genomes uh, of a small number of instances of transfers of mitochondrial DNA in both cases, but uh, much fewer transfers of uh, plastid derived DNA and nucleomorph DNA, and in particular, uh, no discernible examples. So Bruce searched the genome high and low and could not find any bona fide examples of plastid and nucleomorph DNA physically sitting in the nuclear genomes. And we were a bit puzzled by that. Um, and it's part of this longer 
uh, larger question of algal cell and genome evolution, because I've told you that secondary endosymbiosis is, is a, an important phenomenon in evolutionary history, but uh, only two of the lineages that are, are known today actually have these nucleomorphs. So uh, the other algae that I mentioned, things like haptophytes, dinoflagellates, and heterocots, they don't have a nucleomorph. We know from other lines of evidence that they have a secondarily derived chloroplast, but they have no uh, nucleomorph uh, present in the modern day cells. And uh, Tom Cavalier-Smith of, of Oxford um, uh, had this line in one of his papers, the optimum size for a nucleomorph genome is zero. And what he meant by that was that um, in some sense, it's easier, quote unquote, easier for, for the organisms if they were to, to get rid of that nucleomorph entirely because they, the cells would be that much simpler. They would have one less genome to manage and they would no longer have to replicate uh, nucleomorph DNA, transcribe those genes and make those proteins. So the big picture question again is why is it that cryptophytes and chloroacnophytes still have a nucleomorph and these other algae do not? And we uh, eventually um, settled on an idea that came from the work of some uh, Cambridge and UCL researchers, so Chris Howe and Adrian Barbrook at the University of Cambridge and Saul Purton at UCL, they had a very interesting hypothesis called the limited transfer window hypothesis. And essentially what that hypothesis refers to is that there ought to be a correlation between the number of organelles in a cell and the amount of uh, EGT that takes place. And this uh, was triggered from work that uh, they had done on Chlamydomonas and also other researchers had done on, on moss and tobacco. Um, uh, it's believed that organelle lysis is the substrate of uh, DNA for transfer. And so the idea here with this limited transfer window hypothesis is that if you were a cell, like a tobacco cell, for example, and you have 100 chloroplasts in your cytoplasm, you can lyse a handful of them at any given moment and release that DNA and uh, still be a viable cell. And, and that lysed DNA that, that, that comes from a lysed organelle can just fortuitously make its way into the nucleus and occasionally be integrated into the nuclear chromosomes. But if you are the type of a cell uh, where like Chlamydomonas, you only have a single chloroplast per cell, then organelle lysis uh, is no longer a uh, tenable uh, situation because that would mean the cell would not be viable and thus uh, DNA is not readily released for potential integration into, into the nucleus. And people have studied this um, more bioinformatically. I won't go into the details, but down at the, at the bottom here is some work showing that there is indeed a strong correlation between the number of organelles, uh, either plastids or mitochondria in a cell um, and the amount of uh, endosymbiotically derived uh, material you find in the nuclear genome of the organism. So what does this have to do with nucleomorphs? Well, um, it was significant that the ones that we've been studying have only a single uh, nucleomorph and plastid per cell. So uh, it, it basically the, the evidence suggests to us when we, when we saw no evidence of any endosymbiotic gene transfer, we, we came to the conclusion that the nucleomorphs are, are in essence frozen. So the, this window of time whereby uh, DNA would be uh, released from lysed organelles and moved over to the nucleus, that window of time has closed and essentially the nucleomorphs are uh, essentially trapped, okay? Um, so, so that's uh, essentially how we explain why it is that nucleomorphs persist in um, these two lineages, cryptophytes and chloracnophytes, but, ha but have been lost in all of the other 
flavors of algae that I've, I've mentioned previously. So another layer of complexity here, uh, as I alluded to earlier, is this um, the additional uh, caveat, so caveats associated with horizontal gene transfer. So, and that's what I, I mean when I say EGT plus HGT equals complexity and confusion. So these nuclear genomes, um, they're already highly mosaic just by virtue of the series of nested endosymbioses that have taken place. But if we throw in horizontal gene transfer, then things are even more complicated. And it's that complexity that has made it so difficult for people who study genomes for a living to try and figure out who donated their chloroplasts to who over, over evolutionary time. It's, it's a puzzle, as I refer to it, that has yet to be solved. And um, part of the problem is that algae of all of these different types have uh, genomes with both red and green, quote unquote, types of genes, regardless of whether they have a green algal derived plastid or a red algal derived plastid. So they are a mo mosaic of both red and green type genes. And we actually can't tell whether they're EGTs, HGTs, or some combination thereof. And I've uh, shown you this, this cartoon already, um, but we really uh, kind of at a, a situation where the, the situation has gotten worse instead of better. Um, if you'd asked me 15 years ago what I thought I knew about the spread of, of plastids, I would have told you a very different story than what I'm telling you today. Um, uh, we really do not understand uh, how it is that plastids have spread. We know where they evolved from originally, but why it is that they are uh, distributed so patchily is re really an open, an open question. And one of the reasons why that has become problematic is because the more we have sampled different types of eukaryotes uh, in terms of having complete genome sequences, we now realize that um, these photosynthetic lineages are even more patchily distributed than we originally thought. So just a couple of spots I want to point out on the tree. You can see these lineages, the phototrophs are nested within heterotrophic plastid lacking lineages. We see that time and time again when we zoom in on the phototrophic lines. So uh, these are known unknowns um, in a sort of a Rumsfeldian sense. We, we know what the problem is. Um, we know the potential uh, scenarios to give rise to these different types of distributions, but we just don't have enough data to, to solve the problem. And this is a cartoon that I like to show uh, to kind of illustrate this, this problem. Um, you know, people uh, with more data uh, can solve one corner of perhaps of the, of the puzzle of, of algal biodiversity. But in by, by solving that, collecting the data and solving that puzzle and coming up with an explanation for that corner, it kind of breaks the puzzle in another area. And so there's really no coherent picture of of uh, plastid evolution thus, thus far. So let's um, move on to the second part. Now this one's a little bit, little bit shorter. I'm gonna tell you some of our most recent uh, and some of our unpublished work from my lab to try and better understand this uh, problem of genome mosaicism. And it, it, it revolves around studying uh, clusters of very closely related algae. Now, in the early days of eukaryotic genomics, because genomics uh, was uh, very uh, expensive, um, you know, it was a, a precious commodity, the, the, the expenses that went along with the genome project. And so you could sample the tree of eukaryotes, but you only ever chose one lineage or one, one representative from each lineage. And what we've learned from that, uh, as I said earlier, that the problem has gotten worse, not better. And with the advent of modern sequencing um, uh, that can be done very quickly and cheaply, we now are in the luxurious situation of being able to pick a lineage 
uh, as is illustrated here in some of these little uh, cartoon blowups, I'm going to tell you about the pelagophytes. You can pick, pick a particular lineage and sequence the genomes of very closely related strains and species and ask the question, just how mosaic is that genome? And can you get a foothold on this problem of EGT versus HGT at a fine scale uh, uh, sort of um, evolutionary scenario? So the stromenopiles, uh, also known as heterocons, it's okay if you don't know much about this lineage. I'll tell you everything you need to know. They're a really uh, complex mixture of uh, well-known photosynthetic members. Again, things like diatoms, um, kelp, uh, and so forth. And they have red algal derived uh, plastids. Um, they, they do not have nucleomorphs as I mentioned earlier. So some of them are photosynthetic, some of them are mixotrophic, so they, they can photosynthesize and they can thrive heterotrophically. And others are, uh, you know, completely plastid lacking heterotrophs and there are even parasitic lines, okay? This is just a cartoon showing you um, a phylogeny of the group. Now, people have been interested in uh, stromenopiles as a whole for, for quite a long time. Um, the numbers in the circles here are the number of genomes that have been sequenced. And one group stands out. These are the oomycetes. So these are uh, plant pathogens. So the, the um, potato blight, uh, um, this was caused by uh, Phytophthora. So there's been a lot of interest from the perspective of um, well, their, their parasitism and uh, impacts on the economy. Um, so a lot of genomes have been sequenced from subsets of these stromenopiles, but not all of them. And we were particularly interested in these pelagophyte algae. And when the time we, we started this project, there was only one pelagophyte genome that had been sequenced. Uh, it's this one. Um, Oreococcus is a, uh, a little tiny single-celled um, brown colored organism. It, it causes, uh, among other things, harm, harmful algal blooms. And this person at Stony Brook, uh, Chris Gobbler, has um, done lots of work on their uh, ecology as it relates to bloom formation and their interactions with, with viruses and all kinds of things. We decided to build a project around that original reference genome. And uh, it, this is the work of a PhD student, Shannon Sibold, and a former undergraduate, Maggie Lawton. And so we did the following two things. We uh, took four, uh, we resequenced the original Oreococcus genome, and we chose four other strains, very, very closely related to the original one. And we used the latest and greatest sequencing technologies that we could use to produce uh, better and more um, complete genome sequences. So that's, uh, that's what this times five refers to here. And then we chose relatively close, uh, different genera, but still relatively close um, species to two different ones, Pelagomonas and Oreumbra. And we sequenced, uh, so a total of seven genomes in total. This is a very, just a quick summary here of some of the things that we uh, have found. This is some statistics from the original genome 1984, that's the strain. Um, this is a rather old uh, project now, 2011 it was published, and so the technologies were not so great back then. Um, this is our, our new data, so you can hopefully see the, um, uh, the sequencing, the size is very similar, but the number of contigs, so the resulting data that were assembled from our analytical approach. The number of contexts has gone from, from almost 6,000 down to 100 and, uh, less than 150. So a, a dramatic improvement in, in quality. And we used, uh, by the way, that something called Oxford uh, nanopore technologies, a min-ion device, long read sequencing technology. I won't bore you with the details. Combine that with a Lumina short read and then also transcriptome sequencing. Um, the other two genera, again, lots of numbers here. We needn't bore ourselves with the details, but um, the genomes came together very, very uh, uh, 
effectively for these two other uh, strings, the number of contigs well under 100. And this one on the right uh, really uh, blew our minds because um, this was the work of our undergraduate, Maggie, and uh, it came, she came up with only six um, contigs. And we thought that was uh, rather remarkable. And it turns out that um, they are uh, indeed six uh, chromosomes, all six chromosomes of the, the nuclear genome, all completely assembled into six telomere containing uh, contigs. And so this is the first time that has ever happened to us. And it shows you the power of long read sequencing technology. I'll tell you a little bit more about that, some of these data uh, in a second. Um, the other piece of the puzzle, as I mentioned, is this uh, fine scale comparative genomics of all of these different strains of Oreococcus. And these came from a study by Chris Gobbler. Um, the, you know, the numbers really don't matter, but five different genomes all sequenced independently and all put together bioinformatically and analyzed by Shannon Sibold. And down at the bottom, the numbers of genes varies between, you know, 25,000 and so, and, and 20, 26 and a half thousand. Um, so the different strains vary uh, in, uh, in a minor way in terms of the size of the genome, but and also in the gene content. And so we wanted to understand this. Well, why is it that these strains differ in terms of their gene content? And let me just unpack what I mean by strain here. So these are not, um, uh, these are these are all very closely related strains. So in terms of ribosomal RNA identity, which is often used as a measure of uh, how closely related organisms are, these are all more than 99% uh, identical. So they are without a doubt members of the same uh, species, if we want to use that, use that, that term. So it's uh, interesting that they vary in terms of gene content. And to, to contextualize this a little bit, um, is the, is the concept of the pan genome. And you might have encountered this in some of your uh, classes, primarily in the context of bacteria and archaea. And the idea here is that um, a pan genome is sort of the collection of genes that all the members, all the strains of a given species have, even though uh, any individual's strain uh, uh, any individual strains genome wouldn't have that full set. So the pan genome is the, the collection of all of these um, genes. We can further break that up into core genes, which are found in all of the strains, and then subsets of various uh, uh, you know, gene sets that are either unique to a strain, present in only two of the, the strains, uh, three of the strains, and so forth. And this is um, something that is very well described in bacteria. So in prokaryotes, this idea of a pan genome is um, very well accepted. And uh, uh, you, you uh, may be aware of the, just how amazing this is in, in the context of E. coli. Now people have been sequencing E. coli genomes for uh, donkey's ages, of course. And what they have found, there are now thousands of them, the remarkable thing is that the E. coli pan genome is, you know, upwards of uh, 20, 25,000 genes. You know, any individual E. coli only has about 4,500 genes in its genome. But with every new E. coli genome that's sequenced, um, they find about another 30 to 50 genes that have never been found in an E. coli before. So that's where this pan genome line is just going um, up and up and up. Okay. The more genomes that are sequenced, the pan genome gets larger and larger. And uh, paradoxically, in the other direction, the, the core gene genome gets smaller and smaller. Now, in eukaryotes, there has been suggestions of um, a pan genome, uh, of pan genomes as well. Uh, there are studies that, that demonstrate a lot of strain specific variation in uh, yeast, uh, in some plants, and in a, a prominent haptophyte alga called Emiliania. Uh, it's a question really of mechanisms. What is it that gives rise to that difference, those differences in gene content? In the case of the prokaryotes, it's very clearly horizontal gene transfer, but horizontal gene transfer in eukaryotes is a much more uh, controversial uh, issue. 
So with, with that bit of backstory, when, when Shannon did a five-way comparison of her uh, Oreococcus strains, again, all highly similar strains, this is the picture of her, of her pan genome. Uh, we see about 16,000 genes in the core. Um, that corresponds to about 76.4% of the, um, the pan genome. And 20, uh, almost 25% are somehow in the accessory. And uh, not, almost 10% of these are actually strain specific. That is, they're on these periphery of the Venn diagram. They're only found in one uh, of the five strains, but not in any of the others. Now she's in the middle of um, working her way through this data set to try and make sense of it. But what I can tell you so far is that these accessory genes um, out here in the periphery are genes that appear to be, when you analyze them in detail, uh, the products of lateral gene transfer. Some of them are quite clearly bacterial derived genes um, and various other processes that are presumably associated with the adaptation of the dis different strains to, um, you know, niches in their, in their environment. Okay. And this is a, this is a pattern that uh, is reminiscent of some of the preliminary studies on uh, Ameliania and in, in fungi. And so we're interested to break this down a little bit more. The last bit of data I want to tell you um, is, is a more specific story to do with lateral gene transfer in these, these organisms. This is some just published work uh, with uh, involving uh, Maggie Lawton. And these are um, mitochondrial DNAs from the various, the seven genomes that we've been talking about. And uh, it turns out that ori one of the Oreococcus um, 1984 that we've been uh, studying has a stretch of mitochondrial DNA that is not found in the mitochondrial DNAs of any of the others. And uh, when we look at that region uh, up close, we find that it's um, uh, uh, a set of methyl transferase genes uh, that's shown here. And when you do the phylogenies of those genes, you ask the question, where do they come from? They are unique to that particular Oreococcus mitochondrial DNA, and they are uh, a bacterial uh, origin. Okay. More specifically, they are related to sequences in a, a virus that is known to infect Oreococcus. So this is an example of um, a connection that is an emerging uh, theme in eukaryotic lateral gene transfer, the idea that viruses um, are agents of genetic exchange uh, between different types of, of uh, eukaryotic microorganisms. And there's a, a lot of data that I could uh, tell you about in, in that regard if people were interested. So uh, really we're, this picture is gonna wrap up by doing a study um, of this nature. I've already given you some hints as to what our seven way comparison looks like for uh, the pelagophyte strains. But because this group as a whole, Stromenopiles, is so data rich in terms of genomes, we're going to be able to do these comparisons in, uh, at various evolutionary levels to ask this question of when, when we compare strains, species, genera, and different lineages, what is the picture of gene gains and gene losses over this lineage as a whole? And we want to be able to you know, in the fullness of time, be able to distinguish between these different types of gene transfer that have been impacting those, those genomes. So last couple of slides here, this is a more complicated cartoon than some of the ones we've looked at um, already. We, we've already discussed the importance of mitochondria and, and plastids or chloroplasts as donors of genetic material. Of course, those organelles were once endosymbionts. And so in nature, this is an ongoing process. So endosymbionts are currently residing in lots of different lineages and donating genetic material. Viruses are also a potential vector. And also uh, food that is ingested. Uh, ingested prokaryotes and eukaryotes can contribute genetic material. There's even experimental evidence for conjugation between eukaryotic microbes and various types of bacteria. So in the grand scheme of things, the, 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 we're left with several questions that are unanswered. 
we still don't even know whether we've sampled all the relevant lineages. So our analyses are only ever as good as um, the genomes that we have available to compare, of course. We don't understand the relative impacts of vertical and horizontal inheritance. And um, that is to say, we don't know how to, even how to detect and deal with those uh, genes. And by deal with it, I mean um, quantify them and to integrate them into a bigger picture of uh, uh, you know, what the eukaryotic tree of life actually looks like. Is it more like a network or is it more like a, um, a bona fide tree as originally envisioned? And I'm gonna leave you with the, this uh, interesting analogy and uh, it's from a researcher at the University of Maryland and, and um, Charles Delwich wrote that the genome is like a palimpsest, an ancient recycled manuscript in which the traces of an earlier text can be discerned. The current functions of an organism's genome represent the adaptations of the organism to its present environment, but these functions are superimposed on remnants of evolutionary history. So I've really, uh, I like that uh, analogy. Again, this is an actual picture of a palimpsest and you can see the text written in different directions on top of each other. Um, and, and, you know, genomes are very much uh, like that. The, uh, the, the most recent entries into the genome, so to speak, are easy to read. They're maybe not easy to understand, but you can see them. And the more ancient the entries are, the more difficult they are to read and uh, make sense of. So, um, as I said before, uh, oftentimes in this field, the picture things get worse before they get better, but um, we're, we're very much in an exciting phase of, of comparative genomics and for eukaryotic microbes. So I'm gonna stop there um, and thank uh, these people. I've mentioned most of the people in the lab um, along the way, so I won't uh, dwell on this slide. I'll just stop and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, John. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, and, and quite inspiring to see undergrads um, doing such amazing research. <laughs> uh, so basically the Q&A will work as, as usual. Um, you can either send the question to me directly in the chat. You can send it uh, publicly in the chat. Um, if you're on YouTube, please do send your questions in. Um, and if you wanna ask your question directly to John, just please feel free to raise hands in the raise hand function. And um, I'll just, I'll um, let you unmute yourself. Um, so to maybe kick things off, um, I will start off with a question of my own. Um, and so I'd, I've read about um, Lynn Margulis and um, her, her like thoughts about neo-Darwinism and how it was sort of incomplete or unsat unsatisfactory in kind of explaining um, like evolutionary phenomena we see. And she, she thought that endosymbiosis could be like the answer. Um, so like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, well, I don't, I guess the, the simple answer would be, I don't, uh, I don't think she was right on that uh, front. I, I'd need to, to really, you know, we'd need to really dive into the details about what it was about neo-Darwinism that she uh, objected so strongly to. I think there's, you know, it, in thinking about this question, we have to put ourselves in the time at, at which those researchers were doing doing their work. So Lynn Margulis, of course, a, as you know, uh, sort of mid to late 60s, started uh, actively publishing and was, was famous for his 1967 paper and a book in 1970 and, and so on. Really, this is before molecular enough molecular data was even in hand uh, to, to test the endosymbiote hypothesis. And there's really no, um, uh, no doubt that, uh, the, you know, the, the endosymbiote hypothesis became endosymbiotic theory. You know, there's a reason it's written in textbooks. It, it's because no one, um, the, it has stood the fullness of time. Now, you know, Lynn Margulis, as her career went on, she started to, um, you know, question, uh, you know, traditional assumptions. Uh, she was a very strong uh, minded 
person. She had to fight very hard as a champion of endosymbiotic theory. She didn't invent all of those ideas, but she certainly championed it. And, and I would say she's the modern champion of that, uh, of that those ideas. And I admire her for, for that. Um, she, she sort of came to believe that symbiosis explained lots and lots of things. In fact, she believed that the process of speciation in eukaryotes was, a, was the result of endosymbiosis or symbiosis in general. And there's very, very few people who believe that today. And even when she was postulating that believed it back then. Um, so, you know, I, I personally don't uh, believe that there is this sort of uh, clash of worldviews when we think of, of neo-Darwinism and, and endosymbiosis. I mean, I think those two things can coexist. Uh, and I think in the fullness of time, the amount of data that, that has been collected over the years supports that. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah thanks. That was a very balanced and kind of complete <laughs> picture of the thing. Um, Chloe has a question. So, yeah, um, Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I was wondering, I read this um, kind of argument um, from Martin and Lane, which is, um, which refers to the kind of the bioenergetics of uh, genome reform um, that came about under this endosymbio uh, endosymbiosis. Uh, and I think the argument goes something like this um, increases essentially the, the ATP output um, by orders of magnitude. And, um, and I was just wondering what's kind of your view on this uh, as to why um, the genes have been exported from these um, uh, mitochondria or chloroplasts into the nucleus. And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a very good question, Chloe. Um, you know, to, today, really, I focused on chloroplasts and, uh, and plastids. So, so the, the picture, as confusing a picture, a puzzle as that is, one aspect of it that is not puzzling is the nature of the host. And that is that the host of, of plastids was a card carrying eukaryote. So a nucleus containing eukaryote. Um, you know, it's, it, there are lots of things we don't understand, but the nature of the host is not one of them. Um, it, it was a nucleus containing eukaryotes with all the bells and whistles of a eukaryotic uh, organism. Okay. Um, that is not true of the host of the, uh, the bacterial progenitor of the mitochondria. So, you know, to cut a long story short, uh, it, this, is, this is something that uh, Bill Martin and Nick Lane and others have, have postulated that it was the mitochondrial, the evolution of the mitochondria itself that was um, the key event that gave rise to the emergence of the eukaryotic cell. And so in that case, it's, it's a effectively a prokaryote, prokaryote symbiosis, which is to say that the host was not a eukaryote in any way, shape or form. Okay. Um, and, and they have a, an explicit scenario for the different partners involved in that um, symbiotic partnership. We don't need to go into the details uh, at, at this time, but there is, as you said, an energetic argument for why it is that um, uh, the compartmentation of genetic material within the cell and the bioenergetic advantages that were proposed to be uh, associated with that, uh, that, that, that gave the, that that was the impetus, that was the critical event that allowed eukaryotic complexity to emerge. Okay, sort of an excess capacity of, of genes, uh, massive increase in the number of genes, and those genes can do lots of different things for eukaryotes. Now, uh, you know, to be fair, um, not everyone uh, believes that that scenario is correct. There are some who think that, um, you know, it's, it's certainly an interesting idea. It's a very difficult one to get um, evidence for. You know, the bioenergetics arguments have been uh, challenged on various fronts, uh, but, it's, but it's an interesting model. Um, when, when we're talking about the dawn of eukaryotes, you know, 1.5 billion years plus, um, you know, all bets are off in terms of the nature of the organisms. And part of the problems are the, the same as what I articulated all in, in the case of 
you know, eukaryotic phototropes, mosaic genomes. So people are uh, looking hard at the gene contents of all of these different types of eukaryotes and prokaryotes and trying to see whether there are signals in, in extant nuclear genomes that can tell us about the dawn of eukaryogenesis and whether one model of eukaryote origins is better than another one. But um, I'm by and large agnostic on, uh, on, the, on the question, or on the answer, I should say. So I, I hope that uh, helps Chloe a bit. I see. So um, it doesn't, it applies less to the, um, the chloroplast case because. Yeah, the, the energetics argument, I think, applies uh, a good deal less. Now there are, don't, don't get me wrong, there are commonalities, you know, if, uh, if you study this phenomenon of endosymbiotic gene transfer, you know, you can find lots of genes in the nuclear genomes of eukaryotes that are clearly from alpha proteobacteria, which are believed to be the progenitors of the, the mitochondrion. And, you know, mitochondrial genomes are small, uh, even smaller than chloroplasts. So there, there are parallels in, in the patterns that we've seen. But uh, in terms of the, you know, the impetus for those original endosymbiotic events, um, it's really difficult to compare apples apples to apples. You know, a related question is why do organelles retain genomes at all? Uh, you know, I, I, I told this little vignette about the nucleomorph genomes and the transfer window hypothesis. You know, nucleomorphs, that's an interesting modern day uh, organelle that you can study and make hypotheses about. Uh, there are lots of different models for why mitochondrial DNA still exists and why plastids still have a genome as well and there are not surprisingly multiple hypotheses some of which well most of which have some merit in particular contexts and so you know we could unpack that if if need be but yeah. i'm not sure if there are questions in the chat too yeah um, there are there's, okay there's yeah. a out for you um Please. so petya asks um are there any advantage of retaining the nucleomorphs that we know of um and are any of their genes actively transcribed Yes. So are there any advantages to retaining nucleomorphs? I would say uh, none that are apparent to us. Um, and with respect to transcription, absolutely. So nucleomorph genomes, um, maybe I can just really quickly share my screen again. Uh, just, you know, a picture would, would uh, say a thousand words as, as we say. Um, Let's find the best one uh, here. I'm hoping you can see that picture. Yeah. So, you know, this is this is a nucleomorph. Um, you know, we, we've sequenced half a dozen nucleomorph genomes over the years. And so, yes, the genes are expressed. Um, there is this residual cytoplasm and that's called the PPC. And you can see it's this red colored lumen. Um, so this is, this is a eukaryotic cytoplasm. It's just a highly simplified and reduced one. So, you know, there are core eukaryotic processes taking place there. You know, so these nucleomorph genes are transcribed. The transcripts make their way out into the, the, this residual cytoplasm. There are ribosomes functioning there. There's protein turnover and degradation. So, you know, those processes are retained. So, you know, is there an advantage to that? Well, none, none that I can think of, to be honest, because really, you know, there are more algae out there in nature without nucleomorphs that clearly once had them than there are nucleomorph bearing ones. And that's really this, this quote from Tom Kevlar Smith, um, the, the optimal size of a nucleomorph genome is, is zero. You know, I, I, I think that's, for me, that, that says a lot that you could, the cell would just be quote unquote, so much simpler if that transfer window would just open again and all of those genes would move over and then the nucleomorph could disappear and then the organism saves itself so much trouble. Now, you know, that, that's putting, you know, human words into, into evolution. You know, nature doesn't work that way. 
So if the window's closed, the window's closed, and then the system can do nothing, nothing about that. Evolution can't look forward to saying, I'd be better off if the window would open again. It can't work that way. So hopefully that answers your, your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm aware of time. Um, do you have time for a couple more questions? I, I do, but I don't want to, people okay. to feel they have to stay on the line. So oh, no, no, sure. Board That's... silly, you can uh, feel free to, uh, to leave. Um, yeah, go, go ahead. So I, I saw at the end when we were looking at the Oreococcus, uh, mm -hmm. you saw there was a DNA methyltransferase gene, yes. um, mm -hmm. which were new. So yeah. do we know if that they're involved in epigenetics at all in these organisms? That's a very good question. Uh, the short answer is no. We have that really piqued our interest, you know, the functionality there. Um, but there's no obvious indication as to what they would actually be doing. Uh, I did mention the viral connection there. Um, yeah. so, you know, what that gene is doing in the viral genome is not uh, clear either, but. The, the sort of the whole field of viral genome evolution has just exploded because these giant viruses, there are some in nature that have more than, you know, well over a thousand genes and many eukaryotic genes. So I think a lot of viral, these giant viral genomes, the genes are very transient in nature. They're being picked up by eukaryotic hosts. They're being deposited in other eukaryotes, uh, bacteria are in the mix. So they're very much vectors of uh, genetic exchange. And so uh, you know, the short answer is we don't know the biology of those, um, uh, th that particular suite of methyltransferase genes. It's just an interesting observation with a viral connection. And Shannon, I didn't have time to mention it, but uh, she's also found entire integrations of this um, algal uh, virus, the Oreococcus virus. There are, in the nuclear genome, there are entire integrations of the viral DNA sitting in the chromosome that you can very clearly see um, when you do, do GC plots and things like that. So there's clearly a, a very dynamic interaction between those, that particular lineage of, of algae uh, and the viruses that they uh, interact with. I see Chloe's got her hand up again. Yeah, Chloe. Um, I was just wondering when you're talking about the, um, uh, how in, chlor in chloroplasts, um, the um, endosymbiotic gene transfer happened in waves and there are yeah. these secondary and tertiary endosymbiosis. Yes. I was wondering why that's the case for um, chloroplasts, but not for mitochondria. Yes, excellent question. So uh, another way of asking it that I guess is, are there ex known examples of secondarily derived mitochondria? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the answer to the question I just posed is no, we, we have no knowledge of that. Um, you know, part of this may be due to the, you know, as, as we were talking about a minute ago, you know, mitochondrial uh, origin is tangled up in the very origin of eukaryogenesis. And so that is something that makes it very difficult to compare chloroplasts and mitochondrial origins directly. Um, but one of the things that we think is relevant here is that, you know, if you think about uh, chloroplasts, and again, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, you know, chlor chloroplasts, when we talk about um, primary endosymbiotic origin of chloroplasts. So this picture here, here we've got a non-photosynthetic host engulfing a photosynthetic bacterium. So, you know, and, and one of the logical uh, suggestions for why that is quote unquote beneficial is that it, it provides the eukaryote with, with photosynthate. So photosynthesis is an advantage, right? So that's primary uh, endosymbiosis. Uh, secondary endosymbiosis, well, the logic is essentially the same thing. You've got a non-photosynthetic host and it has the potential to take advantage of the photosynthetic capacities of the endosymbiont, right? But in, in the case of mitochondria, you know, in, in this case, both of the, the, both the host and the endosymbiont already have perfectly normal mitochondria. 
So it's not, it's less obvious as to what the benefit would be to acquire for a heterotrophic eukaryote to engulf another heterotrophic eukaryote and retain its mitochondria. So that pro probably goes some way to explaining why um, we, we don't see secondary origins or tertiary origins in mitochondria. Now it's not to say it hasn't happened and that's not to say that we, that it might've happened and we just haven't even noticed. Um, it's, it's not always easy to identify these, these types of endosymbiotic events. But that, I think the simple answer is really related to the, the obvious photosynthetic advantages of photosynthesis of these secondary endosymbionts relative to the mitochondrion. And the last thing I'll say on that is I often get, hurt, get asked the question, you know, in these uh, cryptophytes and chloracnophytes, you know, what, what is the, um, what happens to the mitochondrion of the uh, endosymbiont? So, you know, when we look at a cartoon like this, where is the mitochondrion that, that came in with the endosymbiont in, in a cell like this? And the answer is it's gone. Okay, there's no, there's no, it, it should be in this periplastidal compartment because that's the cytoplasm, which is where the mitochondria are in an, in an alga, but it's gone. And one way to explain that is because it's completely and utterly redundant. The, the host organism already has mitochondria and therefore there's no pressure to retain the, you know, aerobic capacity and various other biochemistries that go along with mitochondria. So hopefully that helps. I see Aaron, Aaron also has his hand up. Yep, hi, um, hi thanks Aaron. for the talk. I, I just had a little, I guess it's kind of a maybe far-fetched idea, but um, relating to like the nucleomorph, has anybody tried like um, hybridizing the nucleomorph DNA into the main chromosome and then like comparing the fitness between um, be between like one algae with the nucleosome compared to another. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting experiment. And I guess it would speak to this question of, you know, are the organisms quote unquote better uh, in, in one scenario or another? Um, you know, the tools just aren't there. So you, you would need to have, uh, you know, proper genetic, uh, technologies to be able to do this. Now there is a transformation system in the case of chloracneophytes. So you can, you can transform the organisms, but you know, moving genes around uh, is not something that is experimentally uh, doable at this point. So the answer is no one has tried mainly because no one has the, the tools in hand to, to do that. But that's a, you know, it's, that's a kind of an experiment that one could do. And there are parallels to that. I think there's, there's work in yeast, you know, where people have put all of the mitochondrial genes in, in the nuclear genome and asked the question, you know, what's different about the cell? So, you know, there are, you can cook up some interesting experiments to kind of address these functional questions, uh, but they're all, they all have their strengths and weaknesses in terms of being able to actually do it. It's a good question though. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, can't see any more questions um, in the chat. So I think um, with that, we'll probably probably call it a day. Um, thank you, John, for, for agreeing to come to speak to us and your fantastic talk and, and this very enlightening Q&A. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for coming and we wish you the best for your exams and um, see you next term. Thanks, John. Yeah, I'm, uh, I really enjoyed myself. So thanks again for the invitation. I wish you all the best uh, with the exams and everything that comes, comes after that. Stay safe. Bye now.